So moving on, uh, we are to Social Security reform in the U.S. budget. We're just going to keep nailing away at these topics. Uh, so we are pleased to have Jagadish Gokhale. Dr. Dr. Gokhale is going to present his paper on Social Security reform, and he's from the Cato Institute. Thank you very much to John and George and uh, Rice University and the sponsors for inviting me to participate in this very interesting and uh, exciting conference. Uh, Senator Simpson's very inspiring words are still ringing in my ears. So I, you know, it's going to be a tough act to follow, although I'm, I'm glad I'm not following him. Uh, so this talk is about Social Security. The title is Social Security and the U.S. Budget, but I'm not going to really talk about the link between Social Security and the U.S. budget as much. I'm going to just focus on Social Security and my beef with how projections for Social Security are constructed. So just to get some fundamental uh, issues on the table, uh, Social Security is financed largely on a pay-as-you-go basis, largely, not fully, uh, at least until now. Um, payroll taxes and taxes on benefits come in, and most of them are immediately used to pay Social Security benefits to beneficiaries. And I'm focusing here only on the uh, OASI, which is the Old Age and Survivors uh, Program, not considering the Disability Program, because that's completely different. It has a different trust fund. It has a completely different set of issues. So when I say Social Security, it's basically the OASI program. So the, any surplus that was left over, which used to be the case before 2010, uh, is invested in Treasury securities. And today the trust fund holds $2.6 trillion, and it earns interest over time. But beginning 2010, which is now the crossover date, which is when uh, revenues for the system begin falling short of the benefit outgo, uh, uh, just re depending on revenues to pay benefits is no, not enough. It's not generating any tax surplus. But if you count interest income uh, as well, benefits are still below tax plus interest income. So the interest income, uh, part of it will be used to pay benefits now from now on. Uh, but le the rest of it will still accrue to the trust fund. So the trust fund will continue to grow. And that will continue until 2024. Uh, after which benefits continue to escalate and now begin to exceed tax plus interest income. So now we must draw down the trust fund, and the drawdowns will exhaust the trust fund by 2036. That's the uh, projection, the official projection as of the 2011 trustees report, the way they make their projections. Uh, the trustees... Uh, make their projections for the next 75 years primarily, but they also report even longer horizon, essentially measures in perpetuity about uh, the program's total shortfall. I think there is merit in the 75 year as well as the infinite horizon projections that they report. One simple reason why the infinite horizon measures have merit is that if you just consider 75 years, the taxes that will be uh, coming into the system over the 75 years will uh, generate benefit obligations beyond the 75 years. If you just truncate the horizon at 75 years, you're understating the shortfall that the system generates under current policy. These measures characterize current policy. They're not forecasts of the future, obviously, because in the future policy will change. And so the outcomes that we will actually observe in the future are not what we are trying to get at. We're trying to characterize the implications of continuing current policy without any change to then understand how big the change needs to be in order to bring the system back into balance. So it's an intergenerational program. That's the other thing uh, that's uh, uh, important about the program. It affects people throughout their uh, economic lifetimes from when they begin working through the end of their lives and it's considered to be a foundational element of the nation's um, social safety net. As Henry Aaron mentioned yesterday, 
uh, I'm sure he would reiterate today that it represents a profound social commitment on, uh, on our part uh, to provide these, uh, uh, this, this benefit, uh, this program. But I would also note that history is littered with the dissolution of programs that represented profound social commitments, pacts and treaties, and so on. So, uh, and that happened because at some point, those programs were economically infeasible to sustain. So uh, it's not sufficient to say that the changes that we might institute in the future is going to happen entirely in the political realm. All public policy changes happen in the political realm. Uh, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't uh, uh, engage in a political economy discussion to advise that process. Uh, and we do so by examining measures of the system solvency over uh, the relevant horizon, whether it's the standard 75-year horizon or the or through perpetuity as a characterization of what current policy holds for the program's uh, future financial condition. So how are, these, how are these projections made? Well, the trustees of the, of the program uh, make some assumptions about the long range, demographic assumptions, uh, mortality, fertility, immigration, and so on. And they also make assumptions about future rates of growth for productivity, uh, future interest rates, inflation rates, and so on. So both demographic and economic assumptions go into making these uh, future projections of the system's financial condition. And uh, those assumptions are turned over to the actuaries who use a method, quote unquote, a method to bring about, uh, to report on the system's financial outlook, essentially the trajectory of taxes, the trajectory of benefits, uh, uh, and then therefore the system's uh, shortfall. Yeah. No, no, I, I have a long preamble to my slides. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, so here's, so during uh, the last recession, the program's official financial condition has uh, deteriorated rather rapidly. I think probably the most rapidly it has, uh, at least since the last reform uh, in 1983, uh, so the trust fund exhaustion date is now 2036. It used to be 2041 just a few years ago. The crossover date has already been crossed. It used to be 2017. Uh, so uh, going, looking in the short horizon in the future, the system's uh, uh, condition may improve somewhat, but it seems unlikely that we'll have sufficiently rapid growth uh, to completely obviate any policy changes. Uh, so uh, I think we should engage in the discussion that always seems to be sliding or slid under the carpet for some reason, uh, political reason. Uh, but the economics of it is that it, the longer we wait to implement these changes, the more costly those changes and adjustments will be uh, for overall as well as for future generations. So sound policy making here critically depends on having a sound method of making financial projections. Uh, uh, but the, I think the trustees' projection, not just I, many other folks who have been uh, studying this issue think that the trustees' projection methods are outdated and the methods are far from sound. Better methods and metrics are available, but the pace of uh, improvement and updating of these uh, methods by the trustees has been uh, glacial at best. This was the opinion of the technical panel on assumptions and methods. Uh, that uh, reported in 2007. Uh, but there seems to be, of late, a general reluctance to acknowledge that the, uh, the methodological shortcomings of the trustees' approach uh, in the, uh, of late because the 2011 technical panel uh, uh, is pretty much silent about the methodological shortcomings of the trustees' methods. And I note that the name of this panel is a panel on assumptions and methods. So methods is especially uh, is explicitly recognized as a charge of the panel, but this panel failed to make uh, much comment, discussion, or recommendations on the trustees' methods. So I have to disclose that I am a member of the Social Security Advisory Board, 
that appoints the technical panel members. And I think we did a very diligent job in making sure that there was adequate representation on the panel uh, by economists, actuaries, and so on. Uh, but the just released uh, uh, report does a good job of making recommendations on the assumptions, but is totally silent on the methods. And so maybe you know they know something I don't know. Maybe I'm a fool and they're angels and I'm treading where they wouldn't, but that's, that remains the situation. So let me elaborate a little bit about my beef on the trustees' methods, and I have several concerns. One key concern is what degree of detail do they incorporate or should be incorporated in the economic and demographic assumptions? Now, this may sound like a trivial issue, but actually it's not. The more detailed decompositions of the assumptions, for example, in the demographics, could matter a lot. How are the assumptions integrated with each other? The, the essence of putting all the assumptions together, capturing interactions among these assumptions be, becomes much more uh, 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 precise and has much better fidelity, again, if the degree of detail is adequate, but I think it is not under the trustees' method. Uh, the method is not transparent. It's basically a black box. Uh, it makes it very difficult to intuitively understand how these various assumptions are being translated into the outcomes. And the TAPM privately reported that they were not able to check that. Is, and so the last two points are kind of key. Is the integration of the assumptions internally consistent? That is, so we have a bunch of assumptions on demographics and economic variables or parameters, and we combine them into uh, future outcomes. But the demographic outcomes that we project have to be consistent with the economic outcomes or financial outcomes for the system that we come up with. Um, and they have to be consistent over the different horizons, short, medium, and long, and I don't think they are. Um, and the final point is, should the assumptions be based exclusively on historical data? I think the trustees' assumptions are based pretty much exclusively on historical data. Uh, for example, they fix they call them the ultimate long-range assumptions on productivity, growth, interest rates, and so on, but they appear inconsistent with the demographic projections that the uh, assumptions on mortality, fertility, and so on are, are incorporated in, into, the, uh, uh, into the outcomes. In particular, the trustees' method does not condition the assumptions about key future parameters on the projected demographic and economic outcomes. So it all comes out of the past, what we see in the future in the demographics should be what the assumptions on the economics are conditioned on, but they're not. So I'll give you an example. Consider fertility rates. These are distinguished only by female age under the trustees method, but we know that they differ significantly by mother's race and education as well. So if you fix future fertility rates just by age, ignoring the effect on overall fertility by age uh, of the future compositional changes in the population by race and education, you're going to miss uh, the changes in the overall fertility rate in the future because the composition of the population that that fertility rate overall assumed historical fertility rate is applied to is, is different. Now, these type of capturing these type of compositional changes in the population also matters for a lot of the other assumptions, labor force participation, education, family structure, and so on. Uh, so therefore, it also matters for things like labor productivity, earnings, payroll taxes, all the key uh, uh, outcomes that we project. And I'm not just, these are not just small things. These could matter a lot, as I'll show you in a minute. The second example is conditioning future earnings on key characteristics of the projected population rather than simply projecting them based on observed averages by age and gender and so on. For example, retiring baby boomers will be replaced. So baby boomers are currently in their highest earning and uh, working phase of their lifetime. So they have relatively high incomes and they're a big cohort. Once they retire, they'll be replaced by similarly experienced uh, uh, successors of theirs but they'll be smaller in lumber relative to the 
the retiree cohort and the younger workers. So that means as a large cohort of high earning individuals retires, earnings inequality is going to be affected. And if earnings inequality declines as a result, because we now no longer have as many uh, high earning individuals in, the co in, the, in our working population, that's going to have a compressing effect on, on the degree of inequality in, the, uh, in earnings. And therefore, it's going to affect key variables in, in the assumptions. For example, it's going to affect the share of taxable wages and uh, total wages. Uh, this type of reporting of intermediate outcomes is not part of the trustees' method, and therefore we, it's just a black box. And we need uh, a better uh, transparency as well as a better methodology to condition the assumptions or in, develop the assumptions in an integrated manner, the economic assumptions, in an integrated manner with what, what the demographics uh, demographic assumptions apply for the future. So I had the opportunity over the last, I guess, between 2003 and 2008, so about six years inclusive, to develop my own kind of uh, demographic and economic simulation of the U.S. economy, primarily to study Social Security's finances. And the result is this book, and my paper is largely a summary of some of the results in the book, the key results. Uh, so I encourage you to read the book, uh, read the book and uh, read the, this paper as well. The paper is slightly different from the book, but it's, uh, uh, I think both, are, both would uh, explain more clearly than I'm probably explaining here what, the, what issues are at stake here. So it contains two essentially parts, a historical simulation that's uh, uh, that goes from 70, 1970 through 2006 and includes a lot of detail uh, that is validated against actual historical data for, the, for those years. And then a forward simulation beyond 2007 to project the momentum of demographic and economic forces that we see in the population today into the future. M many of these forces are relatively inflexible and fixed, so it's a valid exercise to project them into the future to see what the implications are for a program like Social Security, whose financial condition really depends uh, heavily on the, on the momentum of these forces. So, so let me describe just a couple of simulation results that I get. Number one, uh, I use a solo growth model framework, not a growth model. It's not an equilibrium growth model because we can't use an equilibrium model to study a disequilibrium, which is the gap in social security, but it's a models framework that enables me to isolate effective labor inputs into the system. So national output is a function of capital and effective labor. Uh, labor is a, effective labor is a product of labor quantity and quality. Quantity is just the standard total number of years worked by part-time and full-time workers, but labor quality is a function of the projected demographic uh, and economic attributes of the population. It's not fixed. Uh, uh, it's not determined by current labor quality, but it's conditioned on the future characteristics of the population. So the result is that in the future we'll see growth in productivity as a result of having higher capital per worker and technical change, but that growth will be qualified by a drag, a projected drag in or decline in labor quality uh, so in my simulation, ignoring the quality change, the, uh, ignoring the uh, l labor quality change in the future, labor productivity would grow at 1% roughly. The trustees' assumptions is 1.1%. Is but uh, if I include the drag from declining labor quality, I get a 0.7 uh, roughly percent of uh, 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 labor productivity growth, which is a sizable difference. And that, so that's a chart, just a quick view. The dotted, the dotted line, which is declining, is the labor quality drag or declining labor quality index to 2006. And the other two lines show capital per worker. I don't know if it's clear. Well, one of them is a dotted and dashed line. The other is a solid line, but it's probably not visible. Anyway, 
One is capital per worker and the other is labor productivity growth. So labor productivity growth is positive, but it's not as positive as it would be without the quality drag that I estimate. So as a result, my estimation of Social Security's financial condition over the standard 75 years or in perpetuity is much worse than the official 2006 projection. Uh, my revenue increase is slower because the trustees, uh, than the trustees projection because of the productivity, uh, drag on productivity through labor quality decline. And benefit expenditures increase faster initially, as you can see here. So the thinner lines are the trustees 2006 projections and the thick lines are my projections. And so I get a steeper, a quicker increase in benefits relative to the trustees because of what I mentioned earlier, the compression of inequality, a wage inequality that I project because of the retirement of the baby boomers. If you think of the benefit formula as progressive, which means the more you compress labor earnings, the higher is going to be the benefits per dollar of revenues. That's what's going on here. And my revenue line is much lower simply because uh, of the labor quality drag relative to the trustees' uh, projections. In the book, I also provide a comparative evaluation of six different reform proposals, two a liberal, two a centrist, two a conservative, and I use several aggregative as well as micrometrics to evaluate uh, all of these proposals and uh, compare them with each other. And each metric, I think all of these metrics are, uh, are needed, are essential to get a full picture, but I don't think the trustees report, uh, uh, I, I'm sure, I know that the trustees don't report the uh, lifetime micromeasures, which are the lifetime net tax rates, rates and uh, retirement wealth metrics that I have in the book. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so without having this type of a uh, reporting on, on the reform proposals that we have. Unfortunately, I don't have time to discuss the results on, on the reform proposal comparisons, but uh, without these metrics, we will never get a comprehensive evaluation of uh, what these proposals would do to the program uh, in the aggregate and to the individual participants or subgroups of the population identified by various attributes like earnings, uh, gender, and age, and so on. Uh, so I think my main point going from my overall evaluation of the system's shortfall is that these shortfalls are not small. If you measure the shortfalls for Social Security as an independent program, as many people prefer to say, Social Security is off the books. It's got nothing to do with anything else. Uh, it's independently financed. And if you evaluate the program in those terms, then my uh, estimates suggest that we require an immediate and permanent 22% benefit cut or an immediate and permanent 31% increase in the payroll taxes. That's not a minor change. So anybody who suggests that it is, I would have serious disagreement with. Let me stop there. All right. Uh, our first discussant is Dr. Henry Aaron uh, from the Brookings Institution. I won't drop it down there. Uh, I first want to apologize to James Alm. I bet he's accustomed in whenever things are done in alphabetical order to going first, and uh, uh, sorry to have went up, Tim. Oh, that would be my joke. <laughs> uh, then I doubly apologize. <laughs> um, Jagdish Gokhali is uh, one of a very small number of scholars who have devoted themselves in a genuinely serious way to the economic analysis of Social Security. Uh, the book that he uh, uh, called your attention to and the paper presented at this conference is testimony to that. Um, and this paper joins a lengthy list uh, of 
other papers that uh, Jagadish has written alone and with co-authors on this subject. And given uh, the seriousness of this body of work, I think it merits very respectful attention and careful review. Alas, I didn't read the book, uh, and uh, therefore I have not, uh, to the desired extent, been through the detailed model that uh, this work is based on. Uh, and therefore, uh, I can't do what the model really deserves, which is uh, a very careful uh, examination of it in detail. I do want to call attention to the fact that uh, although Jagadish is uh, one of a small group, he's not the only member of the group of serious scholars, uh, and that others have done models, uh, not all of which agree with the conclusions. Um, please don't look at that uh, for, for now. I'll be coming back to it. Um, uh, not all of which agree with the uh, conclusions that he reached. In particular, for example, uh, the Congressional Budget Office has developed a model, not exactly in the style that Jagadish has uh, developed, but nonetheless a serious model, not in the style of actuaries. Uh, they've concluded that uh, the projected deficit over the next 75 years or beyond is uh, similar in magnitude to that estimated by the actuaries, but actually over the next 75 years and measured against gross domestic product, it's actually smaller than the actuary's estimate. So uh, I think uh, it's important that uh, while one pays respect to uh, each and every model, uh, it's natural if those of us on the outside of their creation may not take them quite as seriously uh, and literally uh, as do those who uh, develop them. Uh, turning to uh, the uh, really quite severe critique of the methods used by the actuaries, uh, I want to underscore something Jagadish uh, pointed out, which is that the methods of the actuaries have been subject to review by technical panels uh, for a very long time. Uh, and in particular, the technical panel uh, that reported this year, uh, just a few weeks ago, was on balance uh, came down and suggest with a, a number of serious um, criticisms and comments and suggestions for the actuaries uh, came down uh, on, at the position that the results that they got uh, were not far off the mark. There were a number of suggestions they made. Some would have increased the projected deficit. Some would have reduced it. Uh, the net effect was quite small. Now. Um, there are a couple of specific points made in the paper, if uh, you have had a chance to read it, uh, that I want to focus on. Uh, one was that Jagadish uh, point, uh, claimed that the projected balance of the system, of the Social Security system, uh, had deteriorated seriously since the last major legislation in 1983, and that that was therefore evidence uh, of shortcomings in the projection methods. I think that's not correct, uh, and that, in fact, the record since 1983 is, if anything, testimony to the stability of the projections within the framework that the actuaries use uh, since that period. And that's now you can look at the chart uh, on the board. The uh, top line of this shows the projected balance uh, that resulted after the legislation following the Greenspan Commission's recommendations to Congress, uh, which were passed with one major uh, change. Uh, the projected uh, situation then was balance. Uh, the revenues were projected over the next 75 years to exceed outlays by two one hundredths of one percent of payroll. Uh, now, what's happened since then? The first, the next five lines shown on the table uh, add together the cumulative impact of developments as estimated by the actuaries in the period between 1983 and uh, 2011. Uh, there's a typo on the uh, bottom row. Um, what you can see is there's been a little bit of legislation uh, to improve the balance. Uh, the demographic assumptions 
uh, on balance have been modified in ways that slightly improve the balance. Disability has been more frequent uh, and widespread and recovery from it less frequent uh, and that has had a pretty significant negative impact on the overall balance. Incidentally, just a point of clarification, it is the OASDI trust fund that's projected to be exhausted in 2036, uh, I believe. Uh, the uh, DI trust fund is projected to be exhausted early. The 2036 number is an average of the OASI trust fund. I don't have the report with me, but I think the OASI trust fund is exhausted a couple of years later than uh, 2036. Um, economic assumptions, uh, big surprise here. We've had a couple of whopping recessions uh, since 1983. They're not as good as they were. And there are some changes in methods, which uh, is a sufficiently small number that uh, it might appear that the evolution of what the actuaries do is glacial. I'll come back to that in a minute. But if you add all of those together, the system uh, would have a negative balance of a little over half a percent of payroll. Now, half a percent of payroll for many years was regarded, plus or minus half a percent, as a test of close actuarial balance. Uh, and in fact, the uh, total of 57 uh, one hundredths of percent uh, got increased by about 0.2 just this year. So if, uh, as of last year, it would have been within a close actuarial balance. That's not a, a record uh, uh, if one attaches any weight to these projections, and I do, uh, that indicates that the system has been sliding heavily into the red. What has been happening, and you come to the next line, the minus 1.67, the uh, Greenspan Commission's recommendations, what Congress did, built this into the system. Uh, what it, the system had at the time was big surpluses in early years, big deficits at the end of the projection period, which in 1983 was for, uh, ended in 2058. So in the uh, 28 years since uh, Congress did this, we've lost 28 surplus years and gotten 28 deficit years beyond the 2058 period. And uh, that steady drag is, uh, accounts for the projected long-term deficit. It was built into the um, structure of the reforms. It was a flaw in the structure of the reforms, in my opinion, um, but uh, it's not an error of the actuaries that accounts for the great bulk of the projected gap. Yes, sir? You have not lost the surplus years. They're in the trust fund. I understand that, but the tr projection is based on, uh, brings in years that were previously not counted. Okay. Um, now, uh, an additional point uh, that Jagadish makes is that the finances of Social Security are rapidly worsening. Uh, I think that's not correct either. Um, as it happens, the actuaries projected a gap in excess of 2% of payroll. The number that's shown uh, here is a minus 2.22 for now. The first time that happened was in 1994. The actuaries projected a gap of over 2% of payroll in 1994. And uh, in fact, the trust fund in that year was projected to become exhausted in 2030, six years earlier than it is today. What we've had in the 18 years uh, since is uh, no trend at all, really in the actuaries' projections. There's no rapid worsening. There's a repeated announcement of the fact that there is a projected long-term deficit. Um, I want to turn to, um, and I'm going to take, I may uh, take a bit more time. I want to skip ahead to what I think is uh, the most important comment, which is on how one views the projected de deficit in uh, the Social Security system. Um, the um, tables that Jagadish presents show the impact on different cohorts, different generations of Americans, people born in different years. Uh, 
I believe that portion of the paper is uh, seriously incomplete. And this goes beyond just the projections on individual cohorts. There are two facts about Social Security viewed through the lens of the trust fund, which Jagadish uh, emphasizes, that define the results which he reports, which is that cohorts born uh, after 1946 all will lose money under the Social Security system in the sense that they will pay more in taxes than they will receive back in benefits discounted at the interest rate used within the Social Security system. That is a correct fact. I believe it confirms other research that I'll refer to. Um, the second fact is that the trust fund is a closed system uh, in the sense that at every point in time from now until the sun cools, uh, total benefit payments are to be less than or equal to the total revenues, uh, including interest. Now, from those two facts, it follows by the laws of arithmetic that, uh, well, let me mention one other fact. The first fact is early beneficiaries under Social Security uh, paid taxes for a very brief period of time, and they collected benefits for a long time. They got a big bonus from the system. They collected way more than they paid in. Now, take those two facts, and that means that by the laws of arithmetic, that age groups born after some particular date have to receive benefits worth less than the taxes they paid, discounted at whatever interest rate the uh, trust funds earn on their balances. Now, uh, it happens uh, that Dean Lemer, a, an economist who works at Social Security, wrote an invaluable but little known paper uh, calculating what the impact is not just on decadal cohorts but on annual cohorts. And it turns out that every age cohort born before about 1935 uh, has internal rates of return on uh, their uh, Social Security taxes paid uh, greater uh, than the one that's used for calculating uh, internal, uh, the internal finances of Social Security. And what that means and, uh, is that after every age cohort after, born in 1936 or later has got to receive a rate of return lower than uh, the internal rate of return in Social Security. It's built into a closed system. There's no way out of it. It's the laws of arithmetic. Now, I ask you to hold that thought for a moment. And if any of you have copies of Jagadish's paper, I would ask you to turn to page 52 in it, uh, where there's a, it's table two, and there are two critical lines, lines six and eight. And in the paper, Jagadish shows that the so-called open group liability of the system is smaller than the closed group liability. Now, what does that mean? The closed group liability is the uh, gap between revenues and spending for everybody who has been or is currently in the Social Security system. So you're cutting off all future participants. The open group liability is a measure that includes the, those who are not yet in the system. The closed group liability is bigger than the open group liability. Now, it follows that the trust fund deficits are attributable completely to people who have already reached retirement age, whose tax paying days are over, and whose benefits few people show much disposition to cut, uh, and to others who are currently active now in the system. Quite simply, currently active and future age cohorts are paying fully for the benefits that they're going to receive. Now, put in another way, we have accumulated a debt, christened the legacy debt by Peter Diamond and Peter Orzag, it's a term that Jagadish uh, uses. Because of trust fund accounting, we're committed to servicing that debt largely through taxes linked to employment. 
Were we to view the legacy debt from an overall budget perspective, it would be indistinguishable from the national debt, other components of which also arise largely from past expenditures. In the case of Social Security, the past expenditures have mostly been made already, mostly because some members of those pre-1936 cohorts remain active and are still collecting benefits. But from both a trust fund and a budget perspective, currently active and future cohorts of workers under current law are paying fully for the Social Security benefits that they will receive and they are imposing no burden across generations at all. To say that such a system is unsustainable is equivalent to saying that the nation cannot pay its national debt. And I don't think that anyone has suggested that however serious the mistakes uh, may have been in past public finances, that the United States has yet reached that point. If one way, day we do reach that point, the, argu the uh, argument I have just made leads to the conclusion that that will not be because of the Social Security claims made by currently active and future participants in the Social Security system. There is a liability. People born before I was are to blame. I am right on the cusp. Uh, I am uh, in that 1936 generation. I'm not going to get either a higher or a lower rate of my cohort is not going to get a higher or a lower rate of return. Thank you. Our third discussant, time-wise, is Dr. Jim Ohm from Tulane University. I want to thank uh, uh, John and, and George for uh, the invitation and for organizing this terrific conference and, and giving us the opportunity to hear uh, a stimulating address from um, um, former Senator uh, Simpson. I always apply two criteria when I'm discussing a paper. Um, one is, uh, did the author cite me and my work? <laughs> and second, did the author cite me favorably? Uh, <laughs> Uh, Jagdish did not. Nonetheless, I, I, I think this is a terrific paper. Um, the, the basic premise is, is a simple one, I, I think, and uh, of, as Jagdish explained. Uh, the methodology used by Social Security trustees to project the system's finances is flawed, he argues, because it uses old assumptions about key variables it uh, essentially, especially on demographic variables and, and how these are going to be changing, fertility rates, things like that, does not have a coherent framework for integrating and aggregating these factors. This is the methods and the assumptions part of the, uh, the, the TAPAM. And um, doesn't disaggregate its results sufficiently to give meaningful results. Uh, he all discusses this. And so he presents a very detailed micro simulation model uh, that he terms DEMSIM that addresses uh, these is flaws. Um, these flaws. Specifically, what he does is he he compares his his dem sim simulations with the trustee simulations, um, and he simulates the effects in the paper of six prominent reforms within his dem sim model. Um, uh, he presents the, the, this detailed micro simulation model that oh, I guess I did this. There we go. Um, and, and he finds that, um, in particular, that it makes a difference, uh, which, which, not surprisingly, which assumptions one uses. So let me make some specific observations about the paper and then more general observations about Social Security. Um, first question observation, is, it, is the, the effort to improve the projection methods for Social Security worthwhile? That is, should the, the best, best methods be used? Well, you know, I, I think... The obvious answer to that is, yeah, we want to use the, the, the best methods, the ones that uh, incorporate the most realistic and most current assumptions about uh, 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 the, the relevant parameters of the system. To some extent, I, I have to say, this kind of reminds me of the, uh, the debate that goes on regarding dynamic revenue scoring. Um, 
where there are clearly effects that uh, the, the current methods used in Treasury and CBO don't incorporate, should we incorporate dynamic revenue scoring uh, uh, methods to, to simulate the effects of tax changes and so on. Um, and that gets at it. another issue, uh, that, therefore, is this, this method, is this micro-simulation model, DEMSIM, um, is it a good one? Um, well, well, clearly, I think incorporating latest assumptions makes a lot of sense. Um, I will say also, though, that um, there are a lot of moving parts to the, the DEMSIM. Um, uh, like Henry, I did not read the, uh, the book. I'll wait till you appear on Oprah or the successor to Oprah for, to discuss it. Um, um, uh, and, and a lot of the, uh, the, the details of this, this micro-simulation model obviously can't be discussed in, a, in a, even a 60-plus page paper. Um, so there are a lot of moving parts. It's hard to, it, it's hard to evaluate whether the, uh, uh, the particular assumptions, the particular methods, and so on, are, are good ones, but, but there, there's no question that uh, uh, Jagadish is, is uh, one of the preeminent researchers on this issue, and um, I, I think his, a strong case can be made that um, um, he's, he's using the, the best methods possible. Are there specific features of DEMSIM that should be changed? Again, it's hard to make that evaluation without going into the guts of these micro-simulation models. Um, and so it's, I will have to punt on that one. Um, are there different simulations that should be done? Are there different uh, sets of results that should be presented? I'm assuming that all of this is presented in the, um, in the in longer and more detail in the book. Uh, in terms of the, the sets of results that should be presented, kind of echoing some of the comments that Henry is making, uh, it would be nice to see more disaggregation of some of the results of these, these uh, six reform proposals on different subgroups. I'm guessing that some of that, that detail is actually presented in the book, and there are limits even to a 60-page paper of what one can present. I think most fundamentally, um, does, does it make a difference? Uh, do the, uh, the, the, the changes, the modifications, the improvements that uh, Jagdish makes in his DEMSIM model give different projections than the trustees' methods? And, and clearly they do, uh, and he presents some results on that. A harder question, uh, and here's where I don't have a good answer, and I think this is what Henry's getting at as well, does DEMSIM give better projections than the methods? Uh, I, I guess I, and this to some extent echoes uh, Dennis's earlier comments about a lot of these projections and, and whether they uh, they illuminate or not. I think that, that uh, Jagdish do, uh, but it's easy to, for, to project precisely. It's very hard to project accurately, and we simply don't know whether or not the projections that uh, the Jagdish is making going up to uh, 75 years from now or beyond that give more accurate, better projections than, than the trustees' methods. Uh, so I think the verdict is out on that. Um, but nonetheless, I think this is a real tour, tour de force, a very impressive piece of work. I, I can't think of someone doing uh, uh, better work on, on uh, the, the fiscal issues and the effects of reforms than, than Jagadish. So my congratulations. Here are some, some more general observations about Social Security and its reforms. Um, to, to some extent, getting at the issue, are there, are there things that most everyone can agree upon about Social Security? And, and the, the context is, if there are things that we can agree upon, uh, perhaps this for, uh, establishes a basis upon which some kind of reforms can also be agreed upon. Um, uh, here are some things that, uh, and maybe just putting these up there, I will immediately get some people saying, no, I don't agree with that, but let me, let me fearlessly proceed with making some uh, statements about, I think, things that most people can agree on. One is perceptions are hard and imprecise. I, I think that's an easy one. To, uh, I hope that's not controversial. I think uh, this might be a little more, but I think the existence of the, lar of the trust fund is largely meaningless. Those, those monies have, have long been spent. Uh, um, I think this is, I think we can agree upon that. Social Security redistributes income in many ways, many unintended from the initial legislation. Uh, it redistributes income from higher income to, to lower income, given the way the, uh, uh, the, the primary insurance amount is calculated. It redistributes income from... Uh, singles to married couples, it redistributes income from the uh, 
the healthy to the disabled. It, it certainly redistributes, and this was one of Henry's points, from from later generation uh, uh, generations, cohorts born after 1936 to uh, earlier generations. The classic example, Miss Ida Mae Fuller of Brattleboro, Vermont, who paid in about $20 from 1935 to 1939 through 19 through 1939, and got Social Security check number one, which paid her in that first check over $20. She lived to be about over 100 years old and got uh, total benefits over that time, you know, far, far, far in excess. I, I could invoke my grandmother as well, but um, time is limited, and so I, I'll, I'll move on. So it redistributes income in many, many ways, uh, many unintended. Any reforms, I think, uh, I think we, most people would agree, should not affect current retirees. Any reform should, should focus on protecting lower income workers. Uh, there's, there is, uh, although we may not fully agree, there is a fiscal imbalance between uh, revenues and, uh, that are coming in and benefits that need to be paid from that. And I think um, most, whoops, most fundamentally, in some sense, I think the demographics upon which Social Security was, was established have changed dramatically, uh, uh, mainly in the form of lower birth rates and, and longer life expectancies. The, uh, the San Paul Samuelson pure consumption loan model with and without the social contrivance of, of, uh, of money, this, the, the assumptions upon which that's based, or the assumptions that Diamond's, not, not John's, uh, but Peter Diamond's uh, famous paper on, on neoclassical debt, uh, neoclassical growth model, I think those assumptions don't really apply. And that seems to me to suggest that some changes have to be made. What about disagreements? Uh, social Security, a Ponzi scheme, I'll leave that. Um, even though we are in Texas here. Uh, should projections focus on a 75-year horizon or an infinite horizon? Should solvency be achieved mainly via tax increases or benefit reductions? Should indexation of benefits be changed, either via, for example, a chain CPI indexation? Should private accounts be allowed? I think these are all, uh, you know, and the, the allocator effects of Social Security. I think these are all areas where there's probably some disagreement. So. Do these sources of agreement, uh, of agreement suggest at least some reforms upon which we can agree? Um, I would argue that um, uh, some reforms that have been suggested that cross political uh, bounds suggest that increasing wages, excuse me, increasing revenues via raising the wage ceiling or perhaps investing in higher yield assets, which was a proposal by, uh, by, by Ball, might be a, a, a group meet agreement. Raise, but raise gradually the retirement age. Uh, I, certainly Senator Simpson would agree with that. I'm not sure everybody would, but this is something I would su suggest. But um, to finish here, um, let me argue that uh, I'm not certain that any reforms are really going to happen. Uh, and I'll make the, the analogy to the work I've done on tax reforms around the world. Lessons from tax reforms, I think, suggest to me that reform fundamental reform of a tax system. Matt's worked on some of these things as well. Uh, really only occurs when there are three main conditions. Everybody sees the system as broken. I'm not sure that really applies here. Um, I think people see the system as, as insolvent, but even that is uh, not entirely agreed upon. Not everybody would agree that the fiscal problem facing that is generated by Social Security is, I think, Henry, you've used the word uh, negligible. Um, to describe that in some other work, uh, as opposed to quite significant. So I'm not sure that everybody sees it as broken. Is there a consensus on how to fix it? I don't think so. Is there a strong champion? Well, do these conditions apply to Social Security? Uh, my own assessment is, is, is probably not right now, um, for these reasons. There's no broad consensus that the system is truly broken. There's no real consensus among uh, experts uh, about exactly what to do. Uh, is there a real strong champion who can push the reforms? Is the president able to do that? Is there bipartisan, bipartisan uh, uh, compromise likely to happen? I'm not sure. So where does that leave us? Uh, to return to the paper, I think uh, clearly Jagdish's work is an absolutely crucial component of any reform discussion that people have to consider, uh, especially when you go on the, uh, the talk shows to promote the book here. Um, but I think something's going to happen. Uh, the old Herb Stein axiom. Uh, Something that can't go on forever won't. Uh, what's going to happen? Um, 
My own guess is to echo the comments of, of, of Senator Simpson is that some comprehensive reform of Social Security in the context of broad reforms in which everybody shares some, sac some pain, everybody's Everybody gets, uh, everybody's ox gets gored a bit, I suppose is the expression. Everybody shares some pain, um, I think is, is uh, the only path forward. But there's probably disagreement on that as well. Thank you. All right, so uh, it is lunchtime, and we are on a tight schedule uh, this afternoon because uh, we have uh, a, a, we're running right up against some flight time, so, so we have to end on time. But I'm going to give Jagadish uh, three minutes, if he would like to take it, to comment uh, to the discussants. And then after that, we can all have lunch, uh, and then we'll meet back in here at 1240, uh, 1245. Yeah, very short. Just two pieces of comments. I think, thank you for your comments uh, to both discussants. Um, to Henry, I think the historical uh, evidence that you projected that the original projections uh, which balanced the system over 75 years have deteriorated primarily because we've added more deficit years uh, is fine. But historically, We've had a relatively stable set of demographics, and those years from 1983 to today, and for the 75 year span since 1983, 2058, were relatively more stable demographically than what we will see from here on out. So it doesn't necessarily follow that just because the projections made along the way reason tracked the outcomes reasonably well through today, uh, that the same thing will happen going forward. And that's my point. And unless you use a method that conditions your assumptions and integrally develops assumptions along with what you see or what you're projecting demographically, you're likely to um, miss, uh, and now by an increasing margin uh, in your projections, uh, uh, what will actually happen, I think is still a valid concern. And I think the, my main critique of the trustees' methodology stands notwithstanding your demonstration looking into the past. Uh, the issue about uh, open group versus closed group liabilities and the fact, I don't know how you come to the conclusion that today's workers and future generations pay their own way when neither the trustees nor I have presented that particular breakdown of the open and closed group liabilities. Uh, I have not separated the 65 plus population and looked at past and currently living 65 year olds and older generations to see what their net uh, take from the system has been on, uh, and therefore what the net contribution of the future guys would be, including current workers below 65. That breakdown nobody presents. And it seems like you've drawn a conclusion based on it, so I don't see where that comes from. Um, that, those are my, are my two guys. Maybe we'll have to discuss it uh, later on. Uh, the closed group liability, the fact that there's a liability uh, which is large and which will not be paid for by, even if you're right, will not be paid for by folks 65 and older and past generations, that liability will be imposed necessarily, as you say, the whole system is a closed system, on the younger guys, young workers and future generations. So not so even though the projections and the current policy show that they pay their own way, in actual fact, they will not because the system must be closed somehow and they're the only guys who can bear the, the liability that comes from the past. Uh, for Jim, thank you for your comments. Uh, you posed a lot of questions, uh, didn't answer a whole bunch of them, <laughs> so I won't either. Uh, but uh, yeah, let me just stop there. <laughs>